verses. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is from the coffee chapter. Thank you, Nathan, for educating me. Hebrews chapter 9, the epistle reading, especially the last verse, which reads, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to die again, not to bear sin, but to bring benefits, salvation to those who are waiting for him. And I pray that you are waiting for him. Some of you have been waiting a long time. We don't know how much longer we have to wait. We might be asleep in our graves for thousands of years, but he will come again to bring you what the benefits of his dying on the cross are, which is, as Luther would say in such concise language, forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Amen. Once. Isn't once a beautiful word? Once. Would you like to have a surgeon who would say, Barb, you're going to have surgery or a needle on your foot, and maybe we'll get it right the first time, but if not, maybe the second, or by the third time, we'll get it right. You wouldn't want a surgeon who doesn't use the word wants. Hmm? We have a family slogan. The boy family has a family slogan. And our family slogan, which was born out of the crucible of hard experience, is if it's worth doing, it's worth doing twice. That's our family slogan. Let me illustrate. Laura says, come over to my house. We'll have a little visit. Pastor and parishioner. She might say that. What's your address, Laura? Well, my address is 1234 West... Lantana Drive in, do you live in Imperial? Or do you live here in town? Okay, well, whatever it is, she'll give it to me. And she might give me a few directions. You go by the right aid and then you turn left or whatever it is like that. It will take Jane and me at least twice to find her address. That's just the way that we are. We always have to do things twice. This week I set up the utilities for the rental that we're at. And we had to go to the gas place and to the electricity place and to City Hall. It was one of those three places which said, all right, to get your utility service, we need a copy of your rental contract. Oh, no. Are you serious? Yes, they said. We can't set you up. So we go home. Do you think we could find the copy of the rental contract? No. We're on our way to doing it twice. And then it hit me, it's on my phone. My landlord sent me the contract, a hard copy, which I printed at one time, it was on the phone. I said, we'll give her a digital copy of our contract. So we go back down to the utility place, I can't remember which one it was, I could probably, if I stopped to think, but that would be naughty to tell you which utility company <laughs> gave us the most grief. And we said, we have the contract, here it is on the phone. And she goes, wait a minute. She goes back and talks to her supervisor. She comes out. We need a hard copy. Are you kidding me? So not only is twice our slogan, it's three times, thrice. To end this story, we go back and um, we couldn't find the hard copy the first time. So we call our landlord. And our landlord says, uh, and I don't think I can print from my phone on the church printer. That was part of the problem. He says, I'll email you a copy to my wife who's not far from City Hall. And you can pick it up there. So we did that. So if it's not worth doing, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing three times. We have some friends in Tennessee who have the same problem. They outdone our slogan. They say if it's worth doing once, it's worth overdoing. So it's a little bit gratifying to know there are other people out there who do things multiple times. Now repetition, or reps as I call them, is not always bad. Repetition. When you were back in school and the uh, teacher said, I want you to memorize the presidents of the United States, 
you couldn't do that just one time. You had to go over it and over it and over again. Hmm? Or catechism. Remember catechism class? You might have had to learn it in German. And that catechism pastor, boy, he was tough. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> He would make you learn every Bible verse and every chief part and the meanings of all the chief parts. Remember those days? Boy, those were the good old days, weren't they? And you had to repeat it over and over again to commit it to memory. When you go to the gym, your personal trainer or your own schedule, your own workout, requires not just doing 10 push-ups and 15 pull-ups and 20 bench presses and five minutes on the bicycle, but you have to do reps. You do it three times. So 10 times three is 30, and 15 times three is 45. Reps are necessary to get your body in shape or to reach whatever physical goals that you have. Repetitions are not all bad. The people in the Old Testament did it that way. In the Old Testament, they repeated over and over again animal sacrifices to clue the people in that their sins were indeed forgiven. On a deeper scale, they did them over and over again to tell each child of God, each succeeding generation, that there would ultimately be a superior sacrifice which would only have to be done one, once that beautiful word, wants. But in the meantime, they repeated the sacrifices over and over again to remind themselves that the superior sacrifice would come. It starts out this way. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary. What's the point there? In the Old Testament system, the system of repetition, they would go into a man-made sanctuary. They'd go into a tabernacle, probably someplace like this, which isn't bad, this church set aside for spiritual things. But still, it was man-made. It was imperfect. It was a man-made dwelling, and it had imperfect people in it. Part of those imperfect people were the priests themselves. They would say, okay, we need a representative to offer the sacrifices for us, to sprinkle the blood of the animals over us again and again and again, and we set you aside, we designate you the Levitical tribe. They knew full well that these Levitical people, these people from that tribe, were just as much sinners as they were. They caroused around, they committed adultery, they went through serial marriages, they beat their children, they were lazy, they blasphemed, they worried, they worshipped false gods. They were just as sinful as they were, yet nevertheless, they appointed them because they needed someone, someone to do the animal sacrifice, which for the time being atoned for their sins and always pointed to the superior sacrifice, which was yet to come. Those priests were like modern-day clergy, at least Lutherans, most of whom wear a robe. I think I mentioned this last week. I don't wear a robe to show off and to um, flaunt like, look at me, I'm a pastor. The robe is to cover my sinfulness because the priests were just as much sinners as the people whom they served. This Old Testament system of repetition then, of course, had certain places where, where the sacrifices, where the atonement was made. And it was called the holy place and the most holy place. If we designated this church as one or the other, I would say that uh, maybe this would be the holy place. You come in off 8th Street, hmm? the buzz of the traffic is gone. You come in, it's quiet, it's serene, it's beautiful. And you feel like you're in a special place. That's the way it was in the tabernacle. And a priest, at least on a weekly basis, on the Sabbath, Saturday, equivalent to our Sabbath, Sunday, and perhaps every day of the year, 365 times a year, would come into this holy place and offer a sa animal sacrifice. And the blood which was shed from the sacrifice, that's the point, blood must be shed to pay for sin. 
Sometimes he would take a hyssop branch. Hmm? Oh, I used to know what those were, but just think of any plant that's kind of leafy in a twig and cut it off and, and it would be like a paintbrush and he would dip it into the blood of the animal sacrifice and he would sprinkle it. He would sprinkle it uh, with uh, the people with the blood. Now you'd get stained, but the stains of the blood trump the stains of your sin. And that's what the people wanted and needed and that's what you need. The most holy place, if I were going to say this was the tabernacle, I would designate up here at the front. So the ordinary priests and the people would come only this far. And there would be a curtain here. And there would be the most holy place, which was vacant almost the entire year. Except once a year, you know this, once a year, the priest, no, not the priest, not the rank, but the high priest, the high priest, the priest to priest would go, oh, this is special. This is going to be really effective. He would part the curtain and he would go inside, I think by himself, and he would offer the animal sacrifice there for the people. And he would come out and says, the animal sacrifice has been done. Your sins have been paid for. Sort of. Because it wasn't the blood of the animal sacrifice that cured. It was the the picture, the pointing to the blood of the superior sacrifice which was yet to come hmm, in a heavenly tabernacle, which takes us back to the text. For Christ did not enter, oh Christ, hmm, that's interesting. Who is this Christ person? For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. Oh, there's another sanctuary? There's another holy place and most holy place. Indeed, there is. And he entered, Christ did, heaven itself. Oh, a tabernacle that is not made by human hands. A tabernacle that is not soiled by sin. It's the place where God himself dwells. And Christ dared to enter there. Now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. I like that. I like that. No reps. Just once, as it says, was enough. Not again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year, year after year, and decade after decade, and generation after generation, with blood that is not his own, but once. Then Christ, if that was true, would have had to repeat. Remember the joke? Repeat and repeat, repeat. None of that. None of that. If that was the case, he would, he, Christ, would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now, the old system is wiped away, and the new system is here. No more copies. When Anna prints the bulletin, I think she does it this way, she works on a computer a couple days, she lays this all out, and then when everything's ready, when pastor is done picking at it, Okay, she prints a master copy. She makes it out of the computer. One master copy. Then she lays it on the copy machine and she prints the 50, 60, or 70 copies that you need. Christ is the master copy. Now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of a bull, pigeons, turtle doves, lamb, Perfect lamb, blemishless lamb. No, himself, Jesus, son of man and son of God. That's what makes it effective, by the way. I could die for you. You could die for me. It, you might, I might last a few more years. Let's say you gave me your kidney or something like that and it didn't go well for you, but I would last a few more years. But, but your death isn't, my death wouldn't be effective for your eternal status. Huh? 
But Jesus, son of Joseph, son of the heavenly father, his death by virtue of who he is, is sufficient. Just as man is destined to, uh, uh, with sin by the sacrifice of himself, and just as man, we're almost at the end, is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ, that's, that's natural. We all die once. We all die once. This example or parallel is not given to be morbid, but just to show some things are natural. Some things come our way. Death is one of them. And so what, something came Jesus' way. Hmm? His death on the cross once. Huh? And when he comes again, it's not to die again. The judgment. The judgment is natural. We're at the end of this church year. Have you noticed that? You know, uh, pre-Christmas is three weeks from today. Hmm? So we're winding up the church year. And so we're going to be talking about judgment more next Sunday and the following Sunday. And even the first Sunday in Advent. It's natural for the world to come to an end and there be a judgment, a discernment between good and evil, faith and unfaith. Okay? All right, so that's natural. He will appear a second time, but not to repeat what he's already done in a most effective way. So what, what are you going to take home with this? What are you going to take home with this? What are you going to do with this? What are the benefits of this? Comfort. Assurance. I want you to walk out these doors this morning without ever worrying again that your sins have not been paid for. They have. They are complete. I don't care what kind of miserable things you have done. They are covered. And in the future, you make a big slip. Just turn it over to God. As Luther says, when you hit the pillow at the night, at night, oh, almighty God, I thank you, oh, let me start over. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, our Lord, who has kept me this day. And I pray that you would graciously forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. And this is not part of the prayer, but then he says, Then go quickly to sleep. What comfort. What assurance. And don't look for another gospel. So it grab the assurance, the comfort. Don't look for another gospel. Don't feel you have to supplement Jesus' work. It won't do any good. There is no supplementing necessary. It is finished. And so am I. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the high priest Jesus and his once-for-all sacrifice into life everlasting. Amen.